evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm truly happy to be here today with you on this special day. First of all, uh, allow me to thank all the people that so generously gave us their support to make this day's event possible. I want to thank the Observatorio del Instituto Cervantes at Harvard University for its hospitality to carry out this conference, and especially my dear friend, Francisco Moreno Fernandez. Thank you very much, Francisco, for hosting us and having us here, the executive director of the Observatorio. He gave us an endless support to make this presentation possible. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of my dear colleague and friend, the Consul General of Colombia, uh, Yadi, Yadi, thank you very, very much for being here. And uh, also, I'd like to thank my uh, good friend, Antonio Barbagallo, that gave us such support uh, to uh, find the uh, Joyce and uh, Garcia Marquez specialists that are here at the table today. It is an honor for me and for the Consul General of Mexico in Boston and my wife, Carmen, to be here at this room with uh, uh, Dr. Chandra Bushan Chobi, my longtime and dear friend from the Tecnológico de Monterrey, who so generously accepted my invitation to come all the way from Monterrey, Mexico, to be here with us today. His book, uh, Juan Rulfo, El Llano Sigue en Llamas y las Animas en Pena, has been so revealing to me to understand the uh, not so easy literature of um, Juan Rulfo. So thank you very much, Chandra, for accompanying us and being here with us in uh, Boston and, and Harvard. I'd also like to thank uh, Thomas O'Grady for uh, being here with, this, with us and Emilio Sauri um, um, to be at the table with the presentation, respectively, of Joyce and uh, Gar Garcia Marquez. Thank you so much for all these distinguished men of letters that have dedicated so much time to study and decodified Joyce, Rulfo, and Gabo's masterpieces. The idea of this triple conservatory arose uh, some years ago when I learned that Rulfo acknowledged the influence of Joyce in, this, in his literary formation, which is confirmed through reading Pedro Paramo. Then Gabriel Garcia Marquez explicitly accepted Rulfo's influence in him when he devoured his novel, as he said so he did, the very first night he arrived in Mexico. He said, I didn't sleep that night just reading Pedro Paramo. This again is confirmed after reading Cien Años de Soledad, where we can, we, uh, anyone can uh, see that Macondo is the Colombian Comala. This chain of literary influences has been insufficiently researched. This is why I thought it was a, a good idea and important to hold this event in commemoration of Juan Rulfo's 100th anniversary of his birth, 1917, in Sayula, Jalisco. Thank you very much, Francisco. Thank you very much, the Cervantes Observatory, for accepting this. And thank you very much for all of you here um, guests to accompany us. After a while, we will have uh, some tequila to toast uh, uh, Rulfo. Thank you. Gracias. Good evening. Very briefly, thank you, Emilio Rabasa, Consul General of Mexico, for your introduction. It is a real pleasure to host uh, this event, co-sponsored by the Consulate uh, General of Mexico and the Cervantes Institute at Harvard. Welcome you all to the Instituto Cervantes, to this Observatory, observatory of the Spanish Language and Hispanic, uh, Hispanic Cultures in the United States. As many of you know very well, uh, this is a place uh, to talk, it's a place to discuss, it's a place to chat about many topics regarding the Spanish language and the Hispanic culture. And uh, it is a real pleasure, um, as well as a duty, to pay a tribute to Juan Rulfo. Juan Rulfo has headed the observatory um, since the very beginning. Uh, you may uh, see the poster in the, in the main wall in the, uh, up there. So um, I think this is a good opportunity to, to pay a tribute to Juan Rulfo, who is uh, watching and observing uh, everything uh, we do in the, in the observatory.
Regarding our guests today, you have uh, found uh, their uh, resumes uh, over the chairs, on the chairs, so it is not necessary to read them again. Suffice it to say thank you for uh, your presence here, Professor Chandra from uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey. Thank you, Emilio Seure, uh, Professor of English in uh, UMass, uh, University of Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Thomas O'Grady, Professor of the uh, University of Massachusetts. And thank you all for uh, and welcome to the Cervantes Institute. When this conversation finishes, the observatory and the consulate uh, of Me Mexico cordially invite to you all uh, for some um, food, drinks, and tequila from Mexico. Thank you so much, and enjoy the event. And so, uh, Professor O'Grady, uh, the mic is yours. OK, thank you very thank much, you. Francisco. I'm very happy to be here, and um, I apologize that everything has to come through English because of me, because I, I don't uh, uh, speak Spanish, but um, I feel very enriched by having been uh, introduced um, to um, Juan Rufo by way of this occasion, and so I'm going to share with you some of my reflections on reading Rufo through uh, the lens of James Joyce. Until a couple of weeks ago, I had planned to open my remarks to this evening with a quotation from Carlos Fuentes, but I'm going to start with an anecdote instead. Two weeks ago, I was dining by myself in a restaurant in Washington, DC. I had brought along a book, this book, Juan Rolfo's Pedro Paramo to keep me company. I had hardly set it on the table when it caught the eye of a food runner at the restaurant a young man, around 20 years old, who stopped and said to me quietly, I love that book. Which one of us was more surprised? The young man who happened upon someone reading a book he loved in a most unlikely setting, or yours truly, thinking I was going to spend a quiet half hour or so with a book that I actually bought last summer, and I love short novels, so that's why I bought it. I saw it on a bookshop and said, I better buy that. Um, but did not crack the cover of until I was invited to participate in this round table celebrating the centenary of Juan Rolfo's birth. The young man and I then chatted for about 10 minutes. I asked him if he is Mexican. Nicaraguan, he replied. But then went on to reveal that he is impressively well read across the spectrum of Latin American literature. He expressed particular delight when I told him that I always include Antonio Scarmetta's Ardiente Pazienza, better known in English as The Postman, in my short novel course. I'm actually starting it right after Thanksgiving in my class this semester. And he even directed me to his very favorite writer, Nicaraguan poet Ruben Dario. When I shared with him that I was reading Pedro Paramo for this occasion and that my task was to explore some linkages with, with James Joyce, he informed me that all the great Latin American writers read the European writers and learned from them. So I felt affirmed. But before that, I was affirmed by the aforementioned quotation from Carlos Fuentes that I now want to put into play. I actually used this as the epigraph on my course called Recent Irish Writing um, on the course syllabus last spring. Fuentes has declared, and I have to love him for this, the English language has always been alive and kicking. And if it ever becomes drowsy, there will always be an Irishman. So thank you, Carlos Fuentes. That being said, my assigned task here this evening is not to affirm Fuentes by singing the praises of the pantheon of Irish writers from Swift and Wilde through Yeats and Beckett and on to Friel and Heaney and beyond, but to reflect on affinities between Pedro Paramo and the writings of James Joyce in particular. Specifically, I want to offer some reflections on confluences between Rolfo's remarkable narrative and Joyce's damned monster novel, as he himself described it, Ulysses. I read the text of Pedro Paramo before I read Susan Sontag's forward to the translation by Margaret Sayers Payton, this, this edition. When I did read the forward, I was struck by how closely her description of the novel's central concern resonated with the Joycean affinities I had scribbled down in my readerly note-taking. Um, Margaret Sayers Payton writes, the novel's premise, a dead mother sending her son out into the world, a son's quest for his father, mutates into a multi-voiced sojourn in hell. As I expect many of you know, the opening episode of Ulysses, 
Telemachus, introduces the reader to Stephen Dedalus, the protagonist of Joyce's earlier novel, a portrait of the artist as a young man. I should say reintroduces the reader um, to the protagonist of his earlier novel, a portrait of the artist as a young man. Having returned to Dublin from a brief sojourn in Paris to keep vigil at his dying mother's bedside, Stephen remains conflicted almost a year later by the memory of his mother. So this is from that opening episode of Ulysses. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood, her breath that had been bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Just pages later, again, still in the first episode, the character Haynes attempts to engage Stephen in an interpretation of Shakespeare's Hamlet, the son striving to be atoned with the father. So right away, Joyce has the mother and the father as um, uh, Ropo also does. Of course, each of these references could be read simply as a common literary motif or trope. But what I want to suggest in my few minutes this evening is their link to Pedro Paramo by way of an admission made by Stephen Dedalus. Remembering in Nestor, the second episode of Ulysses, Haynes's casual observation that it seems history is to blame for political friction between Ireland and Britain, Stephen explains himself to the officious headmaster of the school where he teaches. History is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. As the novel unfolds, the reader discovers that for Stephen, and likewise for his co-protagonist, Leopold Bloom, history is not just general, political, economic, social, <coughs> cultural, and so on, but personal. Ditto for Juan Preciado, the protagonist of Pedro Paramo. Late in Rolfo's novel, the reader recognizes that some of the action channels La Cristiada, the Cristero Rebellion of 1926 to 29, as well as the earlier Mexican Revolution of 1910 to 20. But much of the novel focuses not on those events, but on Juan's personal history relative to his mother, his father, and the lost world, the ghost town of Comala. And it is really in Rolfo's inscription of Juan Preciado's search for his father that Pedro Paramo resonates most meaningfully with Joyce's Ulysses. The theme of the nightmare of history permeates Ulysses. With my eye on the clock, I'm going to touch on just two episodes that I believe speak tellingly to Rolfo's narrative. The first of these is the sixth episode of Ulysses, uh, titled Hades, in which Leopold Bloom, attending the burial of his friend Patty Dignam in Glasnevin Cemetery, effectively makes the same descent into the underworld that Odysseus makes in Homer's Odyssey, the text that provides Joyce with the elaborate scaffolding for his narrative. Tracing the route of Dignam's funeral cortege across Dublin, Joyce invites the alert reader to recognize that the various statues and monuments commemorating Irish political figures that line the city's thoroughfares, Sir Philip Compton, uh, Crampton, sorry, William Smith O'Brien, Daniel O'Connell, Sir John Gray, Lord Nelson, Charles Stuart Parnell, represent not just a sampling from the catalog of Dublin street furniture, which is a fine phrase Joyce coined um, in uh, an early draft of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, but a manifestation of how history, the past, memory of the past, constantly infiltrates the mind and the imagination of the individual. In the Homeric parallel, these figures also have their counterparts in the Odyssey. Obviously, Joyce continues this conceit within the grounds of the cemetery itself, referring overtly to O'Connell's grave and Parnell's grave. Relative to Rolfo, however, the more significant passages in Hades are those describing first the stonecutter's yard and then Prospect Cemetery that the cortege passes en route to Glasnevin. So this is Joyce's description of the stonecutter's yard where, uh, where gravestones are being uh, carved to be uh, uh, erected in, in the, the cemetery proper. The stonecutter's yard on the right, crowded on the spit of land, silent shapes appeared, white, sorrowful, holding out calm hands, knelt in grief, pointing. Fragments of shapes hewn in white silence, appealing. And then as the cortege goes by Prospect Cemetery, which is across the road from Glasnevin Cemetery, uh, Leopold Bloom is looking over the, the railings into the cemetery, and here's what he sees. The high railings of Prospect rippled past their gaze. Dark poplars, <coughs> rare white forms, forms more frequent, White shapes thronged amid the trees, white forms and fragments streaming by mutely, sustaining vain gestures on the air. 
In her foreword to Pedro Paramo, Susan Sontag quotes Rolfo as saying that the structure of his novel is, quote, made of silences, of hanging threads, of cut scenes, where everything occurs in a simultaneous time, which is a no time. In Leopold Bloom's case, the public memory associated with the statues and the monuments eventually gives way to his private memory of his father, who committed suicide, and his son, Rudy, who died in infancy. In Juan Preciado's case, countless figures from the past, their names mere whispers, populate the ghost town which his dead father still presides over. And that brings me to the other episode of Ulysses that I believe informs Pedro Paramo, both thematically and structurally. That is the 15th episode, Circe. Fortunately for his boundless legion of readers, Joyce shared with three friends, Carlos Lonati, Herbert Gorman, and Stuart Gilbert, complementary versions of a schema in which he labels the episode's technique as vision animated to bursting point, or more simply, hallucination. Many Joyce scholars agree that the term phantasmagoria is also apt to describe the effect of Circe. While Rolfo's novel does not resemble Circe stylistically, Joyce's text is written on the page in the form of an expressionistic drama, as if intended to be performed on stage. It nonetheless shares with this climactic episode of Ulysses the idea that the individual carries within himself or herself an elaborate personal nightmare of history that needs to be awakened from. No less than the vast cast of characters encountered by Stephen Dedalus and Leopold Bloom in Circe, the elusive and spectral figures encountered by Juan Preciado in Pedro Paramo represent forces, some in his consciousness, some in his subconscious, that he must engage with, confront, and subdue. For Stephen Dedalus, the awakening from the nightmare is dramatic and emphatic, taking place when, rejecting the phantasmagoric specter of his mother, he declares, the intellectual imagination, with me all or not at all, non serviam, which is Latin for I will not serve. He then punctuates his declaration by smashing a chandelier with his ash plant. For Bloom, the awakening is poignant, coming in his vision of his son, who had died in infancy, as a changeling, a fairy child, fulfilling his father's dream in an alternative world. For Juan Preciado, whose return to Kamala has led him into the collective unconscious of a community ravaged and then decimated by the sins of his father, the awakening occurs in the last sentence of Pedro Paramo in his vision of his father brought low by his, by his inability to escape the nights that filled the darkness with phantoms of his deplorable past. And that last sentence is, he fell to the ground with a thud and lay there, collapsed like a pile of rocks. Thank you, and I will now pass the baton to Chandra uh, to, um, to continue this. Good evening to everybody and thank you, Thomas. I was talking to him before we started that finally I'm near somebody who is going to explain what is Ulysses about. <laughs> no? When he wrote that book, he told everybody that at least 100 years will pass and all the critics, literary critics, will scratch their brains trying to find what is there. And still, they are doing that. <laughs> this is what the greatness of James Joyce. And I can tell without doubt that Juan Rulfo would not be Juan Rulfo without having read James Joyce. I know that Rulfo was not that much extrovert, like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, when he accepted that without having read Pedro Paramo, he would have never written 100 years of solitude. He said in many interviews, many times, Rulfo was more like an introvert. But if we see that if Rulfo was reading directly James Joyce, also he had indirect influence through William Faulkner. You can find direct similarities between the works of William Faulkner 
and Kwandulfo. And obviously the language and the play he did with the structure of the novel was inherited from James Joyce. So the direct relationship between Rulfo and James Joyce and then direct relationship between James Joyce and also Gabriel Garcia Marquez. What happened there is he had many influences. And I think the greatness of Juan Rulfo was that if you follow European techniques and all those literary techniques, and if you want to put that in Mexican reality, many people will get confused and they will call magic realism because our own reality is different. And if you use a different techniques of talking, then you become a great writer. These were the writers that influenced Rulfo. And this is the literal acceptance of Gabriel Garcia Marquez when he said that like Franz Kafka, the readings of Rulfo will always be the essential part of my memories. Now we can talk about the debate. There's a final debate between all the like real critics and those who are not critics. What is the success of Rulfo? And what is the essence of his work? They have focused their work on one aspect that is Rulfo is a writer of fantastic literature because in his novel, The Dead Ones Talk. Other critics, they talk about magic religion, that he is playing between what is real and what is not real. But if we find the essence of Rulfo, it's not that dead ones talk or not, it's what they're talking. Even now, we can find the old realities hidden in Rulfo's work in Mexico of today or from Argentina to US. For example, let's debate about what is real and what is not real. Like Jorge Adom said, if you, if you find a tiger roaming around on a roof instead of a cat, it's not a question of magic or perspective. It's just a question of geography. You can find this reality anywhere in Mexico or even in India. So the main thing, the success of Rulfo, is how he depicted Mexican reality with a different perspective. Not only what you can see, instead of what is there inside the mind of the characters. And there, James Joyce, Phantasma was present. That forget about what we see, just let's talk about how the characters live that reality. How they are going to react against that reality. So before Rulfo, all the writers would talk about a normal love story or normal characters, what they lived, normal life. But when Rulfo is talking about Juan Preciado, it's his quest for his father. But beyond that, we don't know that if he is going to look for his father. Beyond that, Rulfo penetrates into the minds of characters and sees how they're thinking. I don't know if you have read a story called Macario. Macario is an exact depiction of Benji in the novel of William Faulkner, The Sound and the Fury, Benji. She is talking the whole story about what the people are going to ask him. You never know if he's talking to somebody else or he's talking to himself. <coughs> so this made Rulfo a different writer for the first time 
that he started using in Mexico the interior monologue. Agustin Yanez had tried before, and he was a good writer, but Rulfo took that writing to almost its perfection. But now the debate is how he become the writer of magic religion, of li fantastic literature. It's because we did not concentrate enough that what he's talking about is the Mexican real problems. The perspective has changed. The reality is still there. The Mexican revolution or the war or the religious war is still there. But now we can see exactly how he started depicting. First, it was nowhere a real stuff about who is going to find whom. He just said, I came to Comala because I was told that my father, a man called Pedro Paramo, was living there. It was what my mother had told me. And I promised I would go and see him after she died. Rulfo said that. Marquez was talking about that he wrote the first paragraph of his book just after copying the first paragraph of Pedro Paramo. And something else, the first paragraph of Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. It's exactly the same. What is the difference? Marcus explained about Pedro Paramo. He said, who came to Comala is there, a son, whom he's looking for, his father, and who has asked him to do so, his mother. Everything is there in the first paragraph. If you see all the works of Mar Marcus, almost all the works of Marcus, he tells everything in the first paragraph. The day Santiago Nassar was going to be killed, he got up at five in the morning. That's everything. You are reading the whole novel, try to find out if they are going to kill him or not. They've already killed him. Because he's saying, the day he was going to be killed, he got up at five in the morning. All the story, and he said, I got that from Franz Kafka. When he said after an uneasy dream, Gregor Samsa found himself converted into a gigantic insect. There I started writing, put that, everything. And then here I find, I came to Komala looking for my father and my mother told me. That is the style. But if that was enough, Rulfo would not be that great writer. What is there is not only what you see in Rulfo, is how you feel. Rulfo is capable of making you feel the agony, the pain of their characters. Even after 60 years, you can you still feel that agony of Juan Preciado trying to find his father. It's not only him. Even today, there are many kids trying to find their fathers because their mother asked them to do so, because they have lost their father, metaphorically, because they don't find them. It's the history of mankind, but especially it's the history of Latin America. We are trying to find our identity. We are trying to find the fathers who left our mothers when we were kids. It's not only the style. It's not only the language. It's that today you can find many of Juan Preciado looking for their fathers. Like the character says, this sentence you can find in other works. Like he said, it's very difficult to grow knowing that the roots where you can hold on to your father is already dead. Juan Preciado, when he comes to Comala, his father is dead. In the first page of Pedro Paramo, when he's saying, I came to Comala, Pedro Paramo is already dead. 
this sentence should be in the page 29. When he was telling, I came to Komala, he is the tomb. He's talking to somebody else. So it's not important who is dead or who is alive. What matters is what he's looking for. What matters is the pain and what matters is somebody in a story telling, please tell him not to kill me. The desire to live. So many times when the critics talk about rule four, I think the structure, the language, the style makes him, obviously make him a good writer. But there's something else. Today, if he's alive as a great writer, is he grasped, he talked about what was the essence of a humankind. Love, suffering, and death. These are three essence of all human beings. If you love, you will suffer and you will die. But in rule four, even with death, the suffering does not stop. It continues. Even after 60 years, we see this reality in all parts of Latin America. As if today, there are many Dolores Preciado, an abundant and neglected wife of an almost orphan child. Still after 60 years, we find there are too many mothers asking their son to go. Don't ask him for anything. Demand that he give you what is ours, what he should have given me and never did. Make him pay dearly, my son, for the way he has abandoned us. I started doing my work on Rulfo in many parts of Mexico. And I said, why he wrote that? And how he wrote that? And it still now is the reality. That's why we get attached to Rulfo. It's one writer who makes the perfect combination of what is the pain of a human being and how you can say it. The best way to say it, read something like James Joyce. But it's not only that. The best way is tell something like Franz Kafka when the reader feels that he has lived what you're talking about. When the reader feels that he has going through what you're talking about. Rule four is a perfect combination of a great style, but more than that, it's not only how you tell the story, it's what you tell. What you tell is the human preoccupation, the human concern, and always is trying to find an identity, be it in your father or be somewhere in the love. The only thing in rule four you will find that everybody has a desire. All characters in rule four have a great desire. And you know what? Nobody would ever fulfill his desire. Juan Preciado will not fulfill. Pedro Paramo will not fulfill his love for Susana. Everybody fails in that desire. And then you ask, and why does it look so sad? It's the times, senor. It's the time in Komala. It's the time in Macondo that looks very sad. Rulfo gave life to the dead souls in Komala. He made them speak about their agony, about their grief. Almost 60 years later, today, we can see that these are dead souls and the way they depicted their reality that today Rulfo is alive. Because like Shakespeare, it's, if you talk about human and if you talk about what they live, there will always be that reality, that human pain, human suffering, and love, and that all ends till death. <laughs>
although in Rulfo, the death is part of that suffering as well. And that makes a great writer. That is called Juan Rulfo. Thank you so much. Again, I just want to say um, many thanks to El Consul General de Mexico in, in Boston uh, and to the uh, Consul General Emilio Rabasa, uh, as well as the Instituto Cervantes and Dr. Francisco Moreno Fernandez and the Consulate's Office of Cultural Affairs and Michelle Arroyo uh, for the kind invitation for making this happen. It's uh, both a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here today. Um, and uh, with my distinguished colleagues, uh, Chandra and Tom as well. Um, I, I think this actually couldn't have worked uh, better, even if I had planned it this way, because um, much of what I'm hoping to touch on in the 10 minutes of remarks that I have prepared uh, will, in a lot of ways, dovetail with what Chandra has just been talking about in regard to Rufo and what Tom uh, brings to light in his reading of, of Joyce. And particularly, um, one of the things that seems most interesting to me uh, is uh, the question of time in all three of these writers and their works. Okay, So to get at what I'm trying to, to say, uh, I want to begin uh, with the opening sentence of uh, Garcia Marquez's 1967 novel, Cien Años de Soledad, as a way of understanding the Colombian author's relationship to Rulfo and to James Joyce. As we just saw a moment ago, the novel begins, many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. So the opening sentence immediately raises a question. What exactly is the tense of this sentence, what's the verb tense? Or to put the question in slightly different terms, where do we locate the present of the novel? Um, obviously, we know that was to remember indicates the future tense, uh, while when his father took him um, is indicative of the past tense. So what I want to suggest is that in a sense, uh, the sentence encapsulates the combination of overlapping temporalities, or times, if you want to put it in, th in those terms, that underlies the novel as a whole. Um, and in particular, it's well-known mixture of the anachronistic and the modern. Um, so as Chandra was explaining just a moment ago, um, Garcia Marquez gives us the entire story, uh, not only in the opening paragraph, but I would say that you get a sense of exactly what the entire story is trying to do formally uh, in the opening sentence. So uh, thus, on the one hand, the majority of the novel is narrated in the past tense, uh, as is the case with the line following the opening sentence. At that time, Macondo was a village of 20 adobe houses. Uh, on the other hand, the novel is ultimately marked by, by what might be described uh, as an overlapping uh, or even conflicting uh, timelines and temporalities, so that uh, the past continuously intrudes on the present embodied, for example, by the ghost of Prudencio Aguilar, the man the Buendia patriarch Jose Arcadio kills, which happens uh, already in the second chapter of the, of the novel, or while the future arrives on the level of individual sentences, as we just saw a moment ago, as well as in the form of the many modern conveniences and commodities that will ultimately transform Macondo, like the magnet, the magnifying glass, the pianola, the locomotive, and of course, ice. With Cien Años de Soledad, then, I would say we get something like a novel in which past, present, and even future appear to coexist within the same setting, within the same space, within the same sentence, uh, giving rise, as we'll see in a moment, to Garcia Marquez's unique style. Okay? Now, no doubt, Juan Rulfo's Pedro Paramo is animated by a similarly intense concern with the relationship between past and present and between present and future. Uh, 
Um, and uh, we can already see this uh, in Tom's emphasis on the role the family plays both in Joyce and in Rulfo's uh, Pedro Paramo, where particularly the um, uh, Juan Preciado's mother uh, tells her son, exigele lo nuestro, which is essentially a claim of the present on the past, okay? In Pedro Paramo, this concern also animates the complex structure of the novel as a whole, uh, with its story of Juan Preciado traveling to Comala to find his father in the present, only to discover a hellish landscape populated by ghosts from the past. And the story of no the novel's eponym, Pedro Paramo, whose destructive drive ultimately lays waste to the town in the past, culminating in his decision, I will cross my arms and Komala will die of hunger. The concern with time and, histor and history, uh, we might say, similarly organizes uh, the fragments that shuttle back and forth between past and present. So as in the case early on with the transition from the fifth fragment to the sixth, where we encounter Pedro Paramo for the first time as an unnamed child, and interestingly enough, much like Leopold Bloom sitting on a toilet. Uh, but also worth noting uh, is that the future, in a sense, never arrives in Komala. Um, as uh, I believe Tom mentioned a second ago, one of the ways in which um, Rufo described uh, the time of the novel itself is a kind of a no time, right? It's almost as if a place like from which time has completely disappeared, right? Um, so then, uh, and in fact, Juan Preciado notes when he first arrives uh, to Kamala and thinks, everything seemed to be waiting for something. But of course, the whole point of the novel in a sense is that like that something never arrives. So meanwhile, whatever modernism is, it doesn't take too much to see that some of the greatest works associated with it are just as concerned with history and time or more precisely with the problem of how to make a story out of it, how to narrativize it. Um, and one need only think here of, of writers like T.S. Eliot, uh, Marcel Proust, William Faulkner, who's already come up, uh, who Garcia Marquez often cited as an influence, and of course, James Joyce, who, uh, as uh, Tom pointed out, uh, reminds us in Ulysses that history itself is a nightmare from which I'm trying to wake up or awake. Yet, with respect to Joyce, interestingly enough, Garcia Marquez has this to say. When I wrote my first short stories, I was told that they had Joycean influences. <laughs> Yet, I had never read Joyce, so I started reading Ulysses. And I did learn something that was to be very useful to me in my future writing, the technique of interior monologue. I later found this in Virginia Woolf, and I like the way she uses it better than Joyce. Sorry, Tom. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, but uh, this is also actually something interesting to keep in mind uh, if we consider Chandra's point about Rulfo as the first Mexican author to actually successfully use the interior monologue uh, and whether or not this was something that Garcia Marquez actually appropriated prior to his reading of, of Rulfo, which uh, his 1955 novel, uh, Ojarasca, would suggest he had already done. So, so uh, Garcia Marquez, uh, however, does cite Rulfo as Pedro Paramo as a major influence, explaining, uh, again, as Chandra has pointed out, I could recite the whole book forwards and backwards, adding elsewhere that the examination in depth of Juan Rufo's work gave me at last the way that I sought to continue my books during a period when he had only published uh, La Ojarasca, or Leaf Storm. Indeed, it was the Colombian writer Alvaro Mutis who told Garcia Marquez, and I have to say this in Spanish because it's a great line, Lea esa vaina, carajo, para que aprenda. <laughs> Perhaps for this reason, many see Rulfo as providing origins of that well-known juxtaposition of the magical and the real characteristic of Garcia Marquez's style of magical realism, a style which would, for better or worse, become synonymous uh, with Latin American literature for many readers throughout the world. In other words, for both Rulfo and Garcia Marquez, the effort to represent the relationship between the past and the present, the effort to think about the way in which we narrativize or tell a story about time demands a specific form, and that form is magical realism. As a story of a young man who, encountering his own ghosts in much the same way Jose Arcadio does, uh, 
and becomes one himself to narrate his story from the grave, Pedro Paramo appears to suggest the pathways of influence are more or less direct. But this ultimately involves reading, uh, I would suggest, Garcia Marquez back into Rulfo, making Pedro Paramo, to my mind, erroneously, an earlier example of Latin American magical realism. Indeed, where the appearance of ghosts in Pedro Paramo emerge as something like an encounter with material traces of the past, in Cien Años de Soledad, ghosts, along with levitating priests, insomnia plagues, and beauties assumed into heaven, all become means to produce a novel with very different ends than those that had defined Rulfo's. So consider, for example, the following passage, which I have to say is one of my favorite passages from Cien Años de Soledad. A trickle of blood came out under the door, crossed the living room, went out into the street, continued on in a straight line across the uneven terraces, went down steps and climbed over curbs, passed along the street of the Turks, turned a corner to the right and another to the left, made a right angle at the Buendia house, went in under the closed door, crossed the parlor, hugging the walls so as not to stain the rugs, went on to the other living room, made a wide curve to avoid the dining room table, went along the porch with begonias and passed without being seen under Amaranta's chair as she gave an arithmetic lesson to Aureliano Jose and went through the pantry and came out in the kitchen where Ursula was ready to crack 36 eggs, end quote. Um, so why 36 eggs is kind of the question that emerges immediately. But one thing I want to say is that the accumulation of detail already alerts us to the novels, and this is Cien Años de Soledad's, commitment to a kind of realism that's absent from Rufo's novel. Um, and this, uh, this realism, the closest Pedro Paramo gets to this would be something like uh, its use of dialect, which is very particular to um, Jalisco. But it also has the effect of sharpening the difference between the novel's extraordinary elements or magical elements uh, and the kind of and um, its quotidian ones. So, more importantly for Garcia Marquez, this juxtaposition of the magical and the real acquires a particular significance in the context of the 1960s, uh, and which is the decade following the publication, obviously, of, of Pedro Paramo. Garcia Marquez suggests uh, as much a decade and a half later when, in response to the comment that his European readers, quote, often note the magic of the things you recount, but not the reality that inspires them, he explains that this is, quote, because their rationalism prevents them from seeing the reality does not end in the price of tomatoes or eggs. He continues, one need only open the newspaper to know that among us extraordinary things occur every day. Uh, and this goes back to the question of geography that was brought up uh, uh, from the quote uh, from um, Adum. Uh, he, I know plain folk who have read 100 Years of Solitude with great pleasure and very carefully without being surprised, because in the end, I'm not telling them anything that is all that different from the lives they live. Now, although there is uh, any number of reasons to be skeptical about Garcia Marquez's comments, they do nonetheless gesture toward what I would suggest are something like a kind of idealized form of magical realism, and give us a sense of what exactly he is trying to like, accomplish. Uh, what appears to be nothing but the mere application of modernist techniques of estrangement uh, here turn out to be an attempt to produce something like an authentic representation of a reality that also draws a line between uh, different kinds of readers. So readers who, on the one hand, consider the novel's magical elements as extraordinary, and, evil, and readers, on the other hand, who regard those same elements as quotidian. And it's this distinction that corresponds uh, between the difference, geographic again, between Latin American and European perspectives uh, that indicates that the interest in the relationship between reader and text here, uh, and in contrast to Rulfo, is attended by an interest in a completely novel consideration, which is the identity of the reader, uh, which is something that I don't think that Rulfo is very much interested in, but Garcia Marquez uh, suggests he is. So, and this is an identity, in other words, um, and that Garcia Marquez would nonetheless conceive as allowing readers to count themselves among the Latin American us that he invokes in, in the quote I just uh, cited. Um, and this gesture, of course, takes on um, a particularly charged significance during the 1960s, uh, a decade marked uh, by um, great turbulence, as we know. 
So what I want to get back to then and conclude with uh, is the idea that, in a sense, if a novel like Cien Años de Soledad points to a future, one found beyond the concluding pages where Macondo is turned into a fearful whirlwind of dust and rubble being spun about by the wrath of the biblical hurricane completely destroyed, right? It is one that, in contrast to Rulfo's Pedro Paramo, must be sought outside of the text itself. The future, in a sense, isn't make an appearance in, in Pedro Paramo, but at the very least, Cien Años de Soledad seems to point to a future that's somewhere beyond the reading of the text itself. So thank you very much. Professor Sauri for these uh, suggestive uh, presentations. And now it's time for questions. Questions for the floor, please. Or comments? Nice. Any admirer of uh, Juan Rulfo? <laughs> yes, please. I have a question about no, ma really. magical realism. Who do you think started that, that trend, mag magical realism? Uh, because I always associate with uh, Garcia Marquez. Um, as, and I know that the term goes back to Alejo Carpentier, the Cuban, and, and that was also those who were using the arts. But, but as someone applied once to Borges, for example. And, and to me, that is fantastic literature. Uh, so where do you see, who do you think started just to be it was applied for the first time? to Garcia Marquez, and I could be wrong. I don't know what your opinion is. It was Franz Ro. Right, yeah. No, no, you have one now. OK. OK, oh. it was Franz Ro. The artist. Yeah, yeah the German artist. Yeah. 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 He applied for the first time, right. but only in paintings. Right. Because before, it was called new objectivity. Mm -hmm. And then he changed the magic realism only in paintings. But then it stopped in 1925. Till 1940s in Latin America, after the translation of many European works, Borges started doing something in Cuento Jardín de los Senderos que se bifurcan. But they did not have that idea of how to use that, like painting cats and using that like ghost kind of stuff. In, but in literature, when the critics started reading writers like Borges, then Carpentier, then obviously rule for then Marquez, they started talking about magic religion. Before 40, it was not that much. One reason is that in Europe, they did not have that subject or that uh, material to talk about magic religion. You need to have that reality. You need to have where the people are born with three eyes. Huh? So. It, in Europe, if a, a child is born with four hands, it might be considered some deformation and talk about that in a medical terms and logic. But in Latin America or even in Asia and Africa, we call him God. We can put that as stuff. So like Carpentier said, our whole history is the history of L'Oreal Maravilloso. Things here that happen, they don't happen at elsewhere. So then they started. But the person who took magic religion to the topmost, according to the critics, not according to like myself, I find more reasonable about the social reality, not magic and stuff. But the critics called Marquez as the Maxim. top of the top of magic realist. In fact, Rulfo, you can't believe, Rulfo was not that much considered as a magic realist. Rulfo did a favor. He influenced Marquez. But Marquez paid him back. When Marquez became famous, then critics started talking about Rulfo as well. Mm -hmm. no? So it's like in, in Mexico, we will talk about James Joyce after reading Rulfo. So Marquez made famous not only magic religion, but also how people started, like, looking for anybody who was before Marquez, Rulfo became the first victims of to be trapped there. And then they started talking about Borges, Miguel Angel Asturias in Guatemala, Mar Mario Vargas Llosa, Carlos Fuentes, uh, 
but the top of the top was Marquez, and after that, the persecution of all the writers before they started, who is there in magic religion? And Rulfo was trapped after many years after Marcus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some more remarks? I mean, I would only add to that. I, I completely agree with Chandra. Um, the one thing, there's two things worth noting. I mean, the first is um, the degree to which that then became uh, a very difficult uh, label to escape. Uh, so much so that more contemporary Mexican writers, uh, like Jorge, uh, Jorge Volpi, for instance, will like talk about uh, the decisive and deliberate uh, departure from that model of Latin American literature that they decided to to um, undertake. Um, and then uh, I think it's also worth noting that like it, it is. I think part of the reason that I included the the more or less ridiculous long, ridiculously long quote from Cien Años de Soledad is that, um, I mean, you get a sense of how different the style is when you compare it to, like, um, uh, Juan Rufo's, especially since Rufo seems to be approximating, as my colleague uh, Erica Beckman has noted, uh, something more like a gothic uh, than anything like uh, magical realism that would appear in a novel uh, or short story by uh, Garcia Marquez. So... Mm -hmm. In that quote that you read, you left out the part when I think the woman said, oh, so-and-so died from looking at this. That's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Professor Brady, no, no comments? No, I, I'm, right. not, okay. I'm not going to go down that. So, more hole, questions, please. <laughs> yes, me and you. It is clear, um, <clears throat> and even more so from what you all three uh, said, that um, these three authors, Joyce, Rulfo, Garcia Marquez, but also others that Chandra mentioned, like Faulkner, um, um, constitute a quite a different parting of, of novelists as compared to their previous uh, generation. In the case of Mexico, uh, for example, La Lagle y la Serpiente, or Yañez, uh, they were all costumists. Uh, not only the theme was uh, mainly, mainly um, a piece of history, but also with a very strict um, format of, of chronological order. Whereas these three and these and this other people that belong to this paradigm, they shattered that. They, they just broke totally with that paradigm in, in, in terms of, of the timing that the media mentioned, but in terms they, they suddenly uh, shipped uh, or jumped from one time to the other, and, and the, the, the reader is like, oh, where is he now? I'm lost. No? That's what makes it so difficult to understand Ulysses and also Pedro Paramo. Um, now, um, so having said that, um, and, and having more or less understood this paradigm, uh, which also characterized the Latin America, what was called the Latin American boom, no? um, would you say that now we are in the, uh, in the path to a new paradigm with a new uh, young writers. Uh, Emilio mentioned Volpi, but uh, there are so many others and out of southern Mexico. Would, or would you say that they are still under the influence of these giants, uh, under the spell of this of these giants and of this kind of narrative? Well, perhaps I can respond in the Irish context. Um, there's uh, a very prolific uh, contemporary novelist, he's actually contemporary with me, uh, Dermot Bulger. Um, and he, uh, years ago, shared with me an interview that he had given, um, I think it was a radio interview, and he said, whenever American academics come to Dublin, they ask him, what is it like to live in the shadow of James Joyce? And he said, the only shadow of James Joyce that I live in is the shadow of his house, of, or of his parents' house, that is in my backyard. Um, and he said, our Ireland is a different Ireland than Joyce's Ireland. Certainly he introduced themes, he, he, he licensed candor. Um, with Ulysses, he obviously showed um, technical innovations that allowed us to uh, register the complexity of human experience, and and Joyce certainly plays with time in ways that you know I, I couldn't go into in my ten minutes. Speaking of time, but um, but uh, I, I think uh, 
contemporary Irish writers will acknowledge Joyce and um, will acknowledge Yeats as the poet, as the kind of twin towers of, uh, of, Irish, um, of modern Irish literature. But they also would push back against that and say we need to find, um, and, and we do find, uh, our own ways of expressing what it is that um, is pertinent uh, in contemporary Irish culture. Um, so um, I think that the, that legacy is uh, very much an academic legacy. Um, and, and as Chandra cited that um, claim that, that Joyce uh, made that um, uh, this will keep the scholars busy for the next hundred years. It does, Joyce does keep the scholars busy for the next hundred <laughs> years, but um, I don't think that the readers fret over, am I getting it right by Joyce's standards? Um, whereas the, um, the lineage in Latin American literature um, may be more complex uh, and, and may be um, acknowledging um, precursors um, in, uh, in, in interesting ways that, um, that uh, uh, for, for Garcia Marquez, for example, to acknowledge Rolfo. And, um, and unfortunately, we don't have enough of Rolfo saying who else he read, um, uh, besides uh, apparently an acknowledgment that he did read Joyce. Um, but uh, I, I was uh, saying to, to Emilio beforehand that um, uh, Borges read Joyce and actually reviewed Ulysses in 1926. He was one of the first um, reviewers of Ulysses, but he also ad ad admitted that he never finished reading it. Um, <laughs> so um, he's not the first reviewer probably to, to have done that, but uh, he found it um, impenetrable at times and found Finnegan's Wake even more impenetrable. He actually continued to come back in his writings uh, about Finnegan's Wake and just <coughs> sort of saying, no, no. <laughs> but um, so, so there are a lot of complex uh, strands and legacies, I think. Rulfo was very intelligent in that terms. The writers I put from Norway, many writers, he accepted in his interview. But whenever they talk about like Faulkner, then they, he would talk about many writers somewhere else. When they talk about somebody else, mm -hmm. trying to like say, it, it was literally influence, but not much like saying that I'm following somebody's path. So he was trying to like some ignore a bit about the direct influence. But and uh, answering the question of Emilio, and also just in, beside that, I would thank him because I believe in destiny like Gabriel Garcia Marquez characters, <laughs> they always believe in destiny. Whenever there is some prediction, it happens in Marquez, <laughs> all the time. No? Pilar Ternera or whatever you talk about. So once we met long time back, I never knew that the destiny would make it believe that today I'm here. And Emilio, apart from working with all the affairs of Mexico, he's a fanatic of literature and comes from a uh, of a family who has been involved in writing. That's why he's more worried about who is next after rule four. <laughs> and I would, I would ask your, I would answer your question is, yes, there is a gap after rule four or after Marcus. They wrote in the 60s. Marcus, rule four, Vargas Llosa, Astorias, Carpentier, they all wrote from 45 to 65 almost. Marcus continued but they were not from like 80s. After Marquez, after Rulfo, after Vargas Llosa, after Julio Cortázar, after Miguel Ángel Asturias, Carpentier, there is nobody like him. Nobody. I call them elephants in Latin America. After 80s, there are no elephants. There are some writers trying to be a small, like buffaloes, <laughs> but they're not elephants. <laughs> because even Marquez, he wrote in decade of two, 2000 something, La Historia de Mis Putas Tristes. Mm -hmm. But Marcos was considered a writer of the 50s, the boom. Carlos Fuentes, mm -hmm. also considered to be the boom. After them, yes, I find because 60 years have gone and there's no continuity <coughs> of that boom. There are many reasons that can be explained, but I think there's a lack of that 
kind of writers today, because Volpi, all the writers, they're good, but they don't go up to that level. They are even, they are beyond even buffalos. Mm -hmm. No? So I think there should be, and about the influence of James Joyce, even in India, if the writers are coming up, or even in Africa, they accept direct influence. You can talk to Arundhati Roy, Salman Rushdie, or if they are accepting because we have got kids taking birth with eight hands. What we need is how to talk about that. If you read James Joyce, if you read Marcel Proust, if you read Franz Kafka, and you have that reality where people believe that I hear you are like God, then you become a writer of magic realism or boom. It's a perfect combination of our reality and their technique. They don't have, mm -hmm. in Europe, they don't have our reality, but we have borrowed their technique and they're the perfect combination. That boom made that Europe look back and said, now we should read Latin America after the boom. Okay. Professor Aguirre. Um, um, I want to go back to Ireland and after Joyce Ireland, and I may be irreverent to say that Samuel Beckett was not an elephant, mm -hmm. but was a huge writer. And in, this may be very subjective, but I, even though I love uh, Joyce, uh, I tend to see more connections between uh, earlier Joyce and um, Rulfo, for instance, The Dead, mm -hmm. that last. Uh, short story in mm -hmm. Dubliners, for some reason, even though it's more conventionally uh, mm -hmm. realist, it has, in terms of time and uh, not stream of consciousness, but the, the way the self reflective right. main character Disease. somehow yeah. reminds me of Rufo. A closer person. Exactly. Yeah. But I was thinking of Samuel Beckett because, in terms of time and space, mm -hmm. the way he handles time. Mm -hmm particularly his plays, but also in his novels, uh, and also the sense of space, this kind of pit, uh, uh, pared down space, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sort of almost post-apocalyptic, mm -hmm. to me, feels closer to Rulfo than Joyce. Uh, am I being irreverent? Or uh, being I, don't, I don't think you're being irreverent at all, because I think that what Beckett is responding to, in part, is his experience um, uh, you know, in... Paris during the Second World War. He was part of the French underground. Um, uh, when you when you read something like you know, Waiting for Godot uh, with uh, Pazzo and Lucky and you know the Gestapo esque nature of, of their relationship and so on, that I think there's a lot to be said that um, Beckett is responding to trauma mm -hmm. in a way that Joyce isn't. Yeah. Uh, and I think that Rolfo as well is responding to trauma. And that was, you know, in, in my reading of, uh, of this, this novel, which I had never read before, and I, and I read it a couple of times for this occasion, and what I was um, uh, very struck by was how it's only in about the last 20 pages of the novel, really, that we begin to see the, um, uh, the, the, the militancy moving up, and then we begin to connect that to the devastation of Kamala and the, the, the emptiness and, and the deaths and so on. And we see Pedro Paramo is this figure who is funding the rebels, but is kind of manipulating and engineering things um, to his own advantages and to his own ends, as he did in all of his relationships, in everything that he did. Um, and so I think that um, the equation that you're making between Beckett and Rufo, um may not be on a literal level, mm -hmm. but on the level of responding mm -hmm. to um, an enormous sense of loss um, and, um, and maybe loss of innocence as well as um, loss of lives and, and so on. So I think that's, that, that's very interesting that, that you say that. Uh, Beckett himself said somewhere, although this may be apocryphal, I think it was in an interview that some Beckettians say, did, did Beckett really say this? Um, but he's, uh, it's, it's something that I give my students when I teach Beckett. 
uh, is that he said Joyce was working with omnipotence. Joyce believed he could do anything with language, and I am working with impotence. I'm paraphrasing here somewhat, but that I uh, have to uh, try to believe in the capacity of language to do anything. And um, there's that refrain in, um, in one of the novels in his trilogy, uh, it might be the unnameable, I, I can't go on, I must go on uh, in, in, the, in the writing process. Um, and that despair that, that words may not be adequate, uh, but they're all that the writer has. And so he, he persists. And one quick note, uh, as a matter of fact, even though uh, it would be a, a very literal reading, uh, but Beckett did translate Mexican poetry. <laughs> Interesting oh, enough, yes, even yeah, though his yeah. uh, Spanish was not mm -hmm. uh, mind-boggling, but uh, right. but yeah. uh, but he did try. <laughs> yeah, he uh, had, he had uh, a contract uh, to do that, didn't exactly. he? Exactly, yes, yeah. and yeah. Uh, he was into like subtracting words instead of adding words, mm -hmm. uh, joys. But he was in contact with certain mm -hmm. Mexican realities. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a very literal connection. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sort of agonistic. Uh, sense that you get from this literature may have something to do, maybe not with the willful, but with mm -hmm. a certain uh, sense of time and space mm -hmm. in Mexico mm -hmm. sure. around yeah. the end of mid-century, I guess. Yeah, I, I haven't I studied know. his his poems, or you know, his poems are such a small part of his body of work, and I certainly haven't studied his translations, mm -hmm. so you would be much better equipped, obviously, to, to know um, that, but that's, that's a fascinating mm -hmm. um, connection, and... Uh, thread to kind of pull on it and see yeah. uh, see what unravels. Yeah. yeah, great, thank you. Any other irreverent question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Antonio, please. Uh, I was wondering if you can um, somehow make some connection with some classics, the classics like Don Quixote or even uh, La Vida del Sueño, Calderón, and even going back to Dante, you know, uh, somehow uh, these, these things <coughs> are, are so um, alive now in the 60s, uh, somehow I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think there is some connection. I think these people must have read the classics. Yeah. They must have read the classics. I had a teacher at Tunam, he used to tell me, I'm a Buddhist. I did not know much about Catholic religion. And uh, when I started reading Rulfo and uh, Marcus, also my favorite, he said, you need to read before Bible. You can't understand them. And now I understand that you, nobody can read Pedro Paramo or hundreds of years of solitude without reading Bible. Obviously, they read Dante Alighieri, the way they talk, but especially the name itself, biblical names, the religious name, mm -hmm. no? And Rulfo was fanatic about playing with religious. Even when he talks about uh, that uh, father in, in Komala and he's criticizing him, he understands very well how people are involved in their religious stuff. And he was an expert. So, and apart from that, that by the way, and Marcus knew it very well. Rulfo used to go to the tombs, the burial places, and find the names on the burial places and put those names to his characters. Ah. That's why, when I talk to my students, I said there's one strange thing. In Rulfo, all the dead ones, they had the names of the dead ones. <laughs> just playing with the words. All those who are dead in Rulfo, just with their name, you think they are dead. As if there are names for the, those who are alive and there are names for those who are dead. That kind of like expertise Rulfo would manage. So very much involved in religion and very much involved in all those characters. And even Marcus, you see, all the, like, if you, if you don't know about the Bible, I used to read something about in India, many things I've never understood about them. Once 
I started reading and also you have to read not only the classics, their history. You have to need, you need to read about Colombia, you need about Mexico in order to understand them. Like uh, if you, Pedro Paramo having too many kids, no? All were sons of Pedro Paramo. That I would not understand in India. No, when I was teaching here at Unam, and first time I asked a girl, how many brothers you have? She told me four, no, five. I said, how can you say that, four or no, five? She said, I have a half brother. I thought his brother was born uh -huh. half, <laughs> small. Because in India, I had never seen anything like divorce, anything about having kids with somebody. In, I never knew about that. So when somebody telling me, half-brother, I thought it was like medio hermano. <laughs> it was in hospital and was born half. Then you have to read a lot about history, Mexican Revolution, and La Guerra Cristera, the Christian War, about Calles and the religious factor. Then many things you can understand why they are fighting and why they are involved in revolution. Even in Colombia, all the, wa the wars mm -hmm. going between the liberals and the conservatives, many things. So obviously you have to go, even Ulysses, like James Joyce, you can't understand a lot without reading Homer. No, the whole book is about that metaphor of Ulysses, the real one, no? and Iliad of Odyssea. So I think, yes, the classics are there always. Can I ask you a question? Because you just raised something very interesting. And I can't remember who it was who observed um, that uh, Juan Preciado's mother's name is Dolores, which is sadness. Yes. Yes. But Juan's name is Juan, which is the name of our author. So Dolores is dead, and maybe a name taken off a gravestone, or certainly done with sorrow. But Juan is alive, as was Juan Rofo. So is Juan Preciado a projection of some sort of, of the author? Do, would you go so far as to make that connection? There are many works. Though normally the critics, they don't find that relation, there are many works done, done on the biography of Juan Rulfo and Juan Preciado. Rulfo's father was killed. Uh, like Pedro Paramo mm -hmm. here also killed. There are many stuff about the way Rulfo lived his life and how it's projected in Juan Rulfo. And why Rulfo, when he was killed, his father was killed, the bullet in, uh, in the head. He's always talking about the lack or the absence of father. Like in the, in the story I was telling, Diles que no me maten. He said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Why? Because he killed my father. He killed my roots. Like in, in there's a biography of Rulfo when his mother is crying and he's asking, you know, even Juan Preciado, why is you are crying? They say, somebody killed your father. They say, and who killed you? Mm -hmm. No? The agony, the suffering. The same thing even Rulfo in his personal life lived. But normally we don't do that kind of like work relating. Right. But then many stuff about Rulfo's childhood and uh, how he was sent to a convent about the Catholic and how he lived. So there are many right. stuff about that. And, and that is a very risky Yes. Uh, form of criticism, and a lot of people do it with James Joyce and Stephen Dedalus, but uh, it is a reworking of yeah. material rather than a literal uh, transfer. Right, exactly. yeah. So, Emilio, yeah, I actually wanted to say something about the the question that was asked about the classics, and actually tie it to the question that Emilio asked earlier about the contemporary moment, because I think that what you get in the if if there is an investment in the classics, it would be something like to the idea of the novel itself, right? Which obviously is born with Cervantes, um, and the post-war period in Latin America, uh, the forties, fifties, and sixties was, uh, as the great Brazilian critic uh, Antonio Candido puts it, like the full blossoming of the Latin American novel, right? Um, and it's interesting because there's a sense in which the the period that follows the 1970s, 80s, sees something like, and to a certain extent the 90s, sees something like a complete um, uh, retrenchment of uh, this kind of faith in the novel, 
right? Um, but I think that one of the things that we're seeing with more contemporary writers, uh, um, in, particularly in Mexico, um, is a kind of reactivation or, re in, or like a re sort of engagement with the question of like what makes a novel a novel. I mean, we spent 30 years, for instance, like taking the novel apart and thinking about things like instead of literary works, testimonio, or thinking about uh, other forms of writing that are texts but not novels, not literature, things like that. Um, and so you get, for instance, in the contemporary moment, a writer like uh, Yuri Herrera, uh, who is a Mexican writer, contemporary Mexican writer, uh, who is doing something that in a lot of ways recalls Rufo's narrative. Um, but even he, although he acknowledges the fact that like, Rulfo es un monu el monumento que uno se encuentra en la plaza, you know, is the monument that you find in the plaza, and it's almost unavoidable, right? He still, like, uh, uh, rejects the idea that, like, he's been influenced by uh, Rulfo in, in any way, or he doesn't cite Rulfo as a direct influence. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the interesting thing is to, to think about that trajectory of the last, let's say, 60 uh, or 70 years and think about what's happened in the novel and Rulfo as kind of really in a lot of ways like the inauguration of that full blooming of the of the Latin American novel it's kind of withering away uh, for a period and it's new sort of revitalization in the contemporary moment uh, with a younger generation of writers so okay so I must confess I believe in destiny and uh, if no more questions, uh, our next destiny is to have a tequila. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, I guess, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.